All right, so once again, welcome. So our history colloquium, so we have a presentation by Jane Baylock today, and uh, our, history, uh, our history senior at the Myers School of Art. And so um, the colloquium of our history is an opportunity for history seniors to present their research to their colleagues and uh, to the entire community and to the friends. And this is a very important event for our historians because um, um, our history, uh, I'm sorry, seniors in studio programs usually present their art in junior exhibitions, senior exhibitions, various other art events, and their work is more or less visible throughout their career. Whereas the research and writing of historians and grows and out and, and um, much less visible. So this is one of these rare opportunities and very important opportunities where uh, the work of art historians uh, is become public. So this public presentation is part of the process that uh, our historians have to accomplish uh, before before finishing their thesis and receiving their BA degree in history. And one of the purposes of this colloquium is actually to solicit uh, feedback and comments and suggestions. So I encourage all of you to keep taking notes throughout this presentation so that at the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions and answers and comments and um, uh, we encourage all sorts of um, um, constructive feedback um, so that, uh, so that uh, Jane can, can finish her uh, thesis in a grand manner. So I just uh, want to say a few words about Jane's research in general. So Jane's bachelor thesis focuses on a 16th century Netherlands artist known as Hieronymus Bosch. And the impact on the art of Hieronymus Bosch of this East, which is today known as Herbertism, but in 16th century it was better known as St. Anthony's Fire. Apparently, this, uh, this disease reached epidemic proportions in Northern Europe in 16th century. And I just have to mention that what a strangely momentous time it is to speak um, um, about the time in the time uh, about about the art in the time of epidemic when we ourselves live in um, through a major pandemic uh, at this moment. So Jane Taylor was um, awarded the uh, the Shield Travel Grant area this year, which enabled her to travel to the Netherlands and Spain. Uh, the cities of S. Hertogenbosch in the Netherlands and Madrid in Spain are the main locations uh, relevant for, uh, for research on Euronymous Bosch. And so Jane worked at the Euronymous Bosch Art Center, uh, St. Anthony's Chapel, and St. John's Cathedral in uh, Hertogen Bosch. As well as uh, she worked, uh, spent quite some time in the archives and library of Museo del Prado in Madrid. And Museo del Prado actually has the largest uh, collection of uh, Euronymous Bosch's works in the world. So this research into primary sources has certainly added depth uh, to Jane's understanding of Bosch's art and its cultural context. It was also a great opportunity to see many of um, Bosch's work in, uh, in person, and including not only the major works, but also drawings and, and uh, sketches and various archival materials related to Bosch. And so Jane uh, responded to various recommendations and advice. And uh, so far, um, I am uh, very happy with her progress. And so in today's presentation, we will see some of the results of this rather extensive research. So now, uh, without further ado, I am giving the floor to Jane. So Jane, don't forget to unmute yourself, and we can begin this. OK. All right. Um... Today, I, as Geddes just mentioned, I will be discussing the effects of a rather enigmatic disease that greatly affected Northern Renaissance art, and particularly in the work of Hieronymus Bosch. Hieronymus Bosch has one of the most complex and phantasmagoric bodies of work that exceeds the imagination of any other Renaissance artist. His violent, fantastical paintings are enigmas of their time, both in surreal imagery and hellish content, and are viscerally provocative. The complexity and beauty of his work is completely unmatched in terms of skill and intricacy, and he exceeds any standard held by any other Renaissance artist in this sense. Bosch was unafraid to illustrate anything he could imagine in his work, no matter how terrifying the imagery or how violent the torture was. Not only does the intricate imagery itself pick any viewer's interest and provoke further questioning, 
The societal and historical circumstances provided Bosch with radical inspiration that is completely significant to his body of work. Throughout my presentation, I will demonstrate examples of this iconography that is vastly under-researched and attempt to fill that gap. I will illustrate the effects of this disease and Bosch's close familiarity to it and how it inspired him to create such fantastical imagery unlike any other. Colloquially known as St. Anthony's fire, ergotism caused symptoms such as the sensation that your skin is on fire, gangrene, and decay of the limbs and vivid hallucinations. As a devout follower of St. Anthony, the namesake of this illness, and a member of a very charitable organization that tended to victims of ergotism, Hieronymus Bosch had a significant closeness to victims of St. Anthony's fire. This closeness gave him inspiration for one of his masterpieces, The Temptations of St. Anthony Triptych. The topic of ergotism symbolism in Hieronymus Bosch's art is vastly under-researched, especially for something that is so significant and almost exclusive to Bosch's paintings, and crucial in understanding the context of his work. While very few other Renaissance artists have explored the topic of St. Anthony's fire and its effect on the Christian mentality, Bosch's paintings show the most explicit evidence of this plague in his work. To understand the aberration of his genius, we must look further into this. Bosch was born Hieronymus von Aiken around 1450 to a family of painters, and he lived a privileged life in his hometown of Sertogenbosch in what is now the Netherlands. I was fortunate enough to receive the Tafshil travel grant prior to the coronavirus outbreak uh, through the Meyer School of Art, and this past January, I visited the beautiful city of Sertogenbosch, Amsterdam, to view uh, uh, Hieronymus's Dutch contemporaries and the Prado Museum in Madrid, where most of Bosch's work is. I spent the most time on Hinthammerstraat, a single street where Bosch pretty much lived his entire life. Hinthammerstraat is located in the heart of the city and has remained almost exactly the same since the late 15th century. If you look at this image of Bosch's monument in the city center, this green building right behind him was his childhood home, and now it's a shoe store. The walk down Hinthammerstraat began with a chapel dedicated to St. Anthony, where not only Bosch worshipped, but victims of ergotism would gather to pray to their patron saint to cure them of their illness. Uh, and to beg for a pre secure position in heaven. Uh, more on this later. Uh, down the street a bit, this beautiful yellow facade was the headquarters of Bosch's charitable organization, the Illustrious Brotherhood of Our Blessed Lady. The organization was founded to promote the veneration of Mother Mary, but they turned their focus to help treat and comfort victims of St. Anthony's fire when the epidemic began to affect those in Saratogan Bosch. The artists of the charity, including Hieronymus Bosch, uh, provided work for St. Jan's Cathedral, or St. John's Cathedral, which was located further down in Thomerstraat. The cathedral began construction in about 1220, well before Bosch's time, and it wasn't completed until 1530, which is about 14 years after Bosch died. Uh, on the right is some of Bosch's earlier work. Uh, you can see Mother and Child and Christ painted on linen, and they are two of the only surviving paintings from Bosch's time that are shown in the cathedral today. Here are a couple studies of Bosch's that show figures suffering from ergotism. Bosch's close work with the infected gave him models that painters in most other areas of Europe wouldn't have had access to. On the right, there is a detail from the exterior panel of Bosch's The Last Judgment triptych. Uh, Bosch often used the image of an ill man with his amputated foot laid out on a cloth before him, showing his misfortune openly in an attempt to seek help in dealing with the illness. St. Anthony's fire is caused by consuming the ergot fungus, which is extremely toxic when ingested regularly over time. It is a parasitic mold that grows on rye grain, which primarily was eaten by the poorer population as only the wealthy could afford to eat wheat. 
Ergot contains the chemical ergoline, a type of lysergic acid that is a derivative of modern day lysergic acid diethylamide, more commonly known as LSD. Even today, ergot fungus is sold on the black market to manufacturers of LSD. In its primitive form, lysergic acid does not provide the euphoric sensations that the contemporary drug acid is known for. While still providing intense hallucinations, ergolines antagonize neurotransmitters such as dopamine and serotonin, causing uncontrollable terror and panic, and combined with the feeling of already being engulfed in flames and other horrible convulsions, Christians believe that this disease was a direct smiting from God. Alongside the bubonic plague of the 14th century, St. Anthony's fire caused a major shift in Christians' perspectives of their God, learning to fear him rather than to look to him for guidance. Nevertheless, Antonine monks persisted in their attempts to cure the disease. One of the most popular treatments, aside from prayer, which was the primarily recommended treatment, were talismans made of mandrake root. Uh, mandrake root was used very frequently in the treatment of a vast assortment ailments. It was known for its power to reverse infertility, which was very popular considering infertility in men, particularly due to the gangrene of the illness taking their genitalia, and miscarriage in women were often a result of ergot poisoning. Additionally, the mandrake root is a cold substance, according to the theory of the humerus. Uh, which was an ancient system of medical diagnosis that dates back to ancient Greece. The four temperaments were the four main fluids of the body, recognized at the time at least, and each showed the coldness or hotness of a substance and the wetness or dryness. As shown here, the four fluids recognized were blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. Illness was viewed as an imbalance in the humors, and so measures will be taken in attempt to balance them out. For example, a fever was considered an excess of hot humor, and so a cold substance like mandrake root would be used to balance out the excess of this heat. Because of this, mandrake root became a symbol of healing, particularly to St. Anthony's fire, and was an icon that Bosch explored in his work. St. Anthony, being the patron saint of the infected, orders and brotherhoods devoted to him would commission the work of local artists to create prints such as these that were more widely available to the diseased. While churches would commission larger paintings such as Bosch's Temptations of St. Anthony Triptych, there are a few other than Bosch's that present explicit representation of those suffering from ergotism. Here, a hospital dedicated to treating ergotism would be marked accordingly. Uh, to mark the specialization of the hospital, amputated hands and feet would be strung above the entrance, uh, and these were a calling to those suffering from the gangrene of disease in particular. Also known as Anthony the Great, the Desert Father and St. Anthony Abbot, he became patron saint of the illness after Christians began to associate their suffering with the temptations of St. Anthony for nearly his, that plagued him for nearly his entire life. This iconography goes hand in hand with the evidence of St. Anthony's fire in Hieronymus Bosch's work. This disease would cause hallucinations of demons and the sensation of being, of, of burning alive directly with Anthony's temptations. Most depictions of St. Anthony include his midair fights with winged demons as seen in the image just shown, and also in the left panel of Bosch's triptych. If we look closer at the left panel, we can see a flock of avian monsters carrying Anthony through the air while he prays to God for guidance. The subject of St. Anthony being assaulted by winged demons that mock and torment him midair has been explored greatly throughout art history. It was also said that one of the hallucinatory symptoms of ergotism was the feeling of flying and being able to fly. There's even a report of a man in the 1951 outbreak in France that thought he could fly. Uh, so he jumped out of a second story window of the hospital. Upon impact, he telescoped his legs and shattered every bone in them. 
and then con- uh, continued to sprint 50 meters until he was finally taken down by guards and taken back into the hospital. Uh, we have another example here in this engraving of The Temptations of St. Anthony by Martin Schongauer, which is probably one of the most famous uh, representations of this motif of Anthony's life. And next to it here is uh, Michelangelo's painted copy after him, which he made when he was only 12. Below, again on the left panel, Anthony appears as a hermit being helped along by two monks and another man. The lurking group of demons to the side gesture up to their counterparts in the sky as they too torment Anthony. Behind, a giant has been shot through the forehead with an arrow and his body has been perverted into a tavern of sin. Here, a fish is shown consuming another fish, a direct connection between the Christian symbol of a fish and cannibalism, which is probably one of the most barbaric things anybody or a creature could do. And in the dead center, moving on to the center panel, uh, demons gather by a ruined chapel. Next to them, Anthony kneels in prayer, his holy hand gesture mirroring Christ where he points inside the chapel. Um, through this sight of Christ, Anthony is able to trudge through the series of demons that continue to plague him. And while this array of demons appears to be practicing some sort of black mass, as many researchers of Bosch claim, it is instead a powerful ritual used by healers of St. Anthony's fire, warped through hallucinating eyes. At one of the earliest Antonine hospitals, a very specific treatment would be given to those uh, sufferers only once a year. Uh, they would pilgrimage to the hospital in France, in France, which was established in 1093, to receive what is known as the Holy Vintage. Uh, it was given to only those on death's door, and it was made of exotic, expensive oils and herbs and wines. But what set it apart from other potions was that it was purportedly strained over the remains of St. Anthony himself. After anointing the potion to the forehead of the diseased, the Antonine monks would promise that your suffering would end in one of two ways. Uh, within a few days of receiving treatment, you would recover entirely and your symptoms would go away or you would die. But either way, the monks assured you that your suffering would end. This figure of a high priestess has snakes atop her head, uh, mimicking the mitre of a bishop. It holds out a golden cup, likely full of the holy vintage, to a pig-faced lute player. Behind him, a man with a missing leg is leaning against him with support, for support. This is likely a victim of ergotism, preparing to receive treatment and attempt to end his suffering. Here is a detail of him, and as you can see, he both leans onto a cane and uses a crutch. It is likely that the scene is told through the eyes of, his ma of this man, as he is the only figure in the center panel that appears to be almost completely human. But here you can see a tail that is vaguely resemblant of a mandrake root, and so that could also be um, indicative of his status as a victim of St. Anthony's fire, currently undergoing the mandrake treatment. Um, below him on the center panel, I've also included another image of a man who also is probably a victim of ergotism. Uh, he's dressed like a magician with a large top hat and a cape, and his laying out amputated foot on a cloth next to his crutch marks his status as a victim of St. Anthony's fire in an attempt to beg for help. One of the very few other depictions of a victim with ergotism in art is shown here in a panel of the Isenheim altarpiece uh, painted by Matthias Grunewald. It shows another scene of Anthony's life of temptations. And here a group of demons are violently attacking him. Cowering behind him is clearly a victim of late stage ergotism with boils and skin discoloration all over his body. And he raises a shriveled gangrene arm above him in attempt to shield him from Anthony's demons. Here St. Anthony is quite literally shielding a victim of ergotism from the, from the demons that torment himself. Trailing away from the center panel of the Temptations of St. Anthony, a village uh, 
one of these demons is part mandrake root. And so one sufferer from ergotism could interpret the healing treatment of the gnarled root for some nightmarish school. It carries a child, giving it the significant symbolism of a mother and child as mandrake root was used to treat fertility. This doubles, this creature doubles as a su successful pregnancy or else a demon carrying another unfortunate miscarriage into the underworld. Deep in the distance of the center panel, a village is engulfed in flames, demons circling overhead. In almost every one of Bosch's depictions of St. Anthony, there is a chapel in the background engulfed in flames. This provides a literal interpretation of St. Anthony's fire and is another motif that is likely exclusive to Bosch's work. This could be due to another historical event that tormented Sir Token Bosch during Bosch's childhood. In 1463, when Bosch was about 13, a fire raised and destroyed nearly every building and farm, including Bosch's first childhood home and the asylum where he and his father would tend to the victims of ergotism. So atop this already developed closeness to the issue of St. Anthony's fire, it seemed to the citizens of Sir Togan Bosch that the apocalypse was upon them and Satan's dominion over the world was eminent. Such combined trauma revolving around Bosch's devotion provided him inspiration that most other artists would never get. Another example of this iconography in Bosch's work includes this close-up of the temptations of St. Anthony. Inside the chapel to St. Anthony, marked by a Tau cross here, his holy symbol, a fire is burning. And here is another example in another one of Bosch's interpretations of Anthony's temptations. And to complete the triptych on the right, Anthony has finally reached a contemplative life free from sin and the lifelong torment that his demons have tortured him with. The temptations, however, remain, particularly in the form of a nude woman standing in a stream, emerging from a red curtain. Uh, in medieval Christianity, a siren was used as a representation of a beautiful woman under the guise of a demon, tempting, to, tempting men into a life of sin and cohorting with the devil. Finally, a woman and a man fly a fish out of the panel. This could be a representation of a witch, uh, as denoted by the gold spark, tra spark trailing away from it. Uh, there are many accounts of women falling victims to St. Anthony's fire and were uh, subjected to witch trials. And now that we know that they were only probably tripping on ergot mold. Uh, the witch here is shown exiting Anthony's life, leaving to wreak havoc among the other ergot infested and he has now reached a state of peace under the Lord. This set of iconogra iconographical figures is very exclusive to Bosch's work, and he was one of the few to so boldly expose the horrors of ergotism and to delve into a world created by fever dreams and fueled by primitive psychedelics. He uses the tragedy of these infected people and warps them into ghouls and phantoms that a person would never experience away from this setting. Bosch's close work with the victims of St. Anthony's fire and hearing all of their nightmares and visions, the phantasmagoria that is his body of work. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jane. Thank you very much. Um, so at this time, I would like to open the floor for questions and comments. So please, if you have questions and comments, don't forget to unmute yourself first and go ahead and ask. Hey, Jane. It's Hillary. Hi. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> so it's very interesting that you weren't able to find very many others that were depicting ergotism at this point. So why do you think that others weren't pursuing the subject or what else were they actually depicting during this time? So I think that for the most part, they weren't as close to it as Bosch was. So like I said, Bosch grew up in an area that was one of the most area that was one of the most ravaged areas by this illness. And as he personally like comforted and treated victims of this disease, 
Um, I just don't think any other artist would have been able to capture the horror that he, he was able to. Um, okay. I mean, as seen in uh, Grunewald's uh, work, he it, it did exist in other work. I'm not saying that it didn't exist in other work, but it was just very hard to find anything else besides Bosch's that fit this iconography. Of most course. most of other disease iconography focused on the Black Death, which is more well known. How far was the spread of the disease as well? So it was really concentrated into different um, areas. It really depends. So ergot is it thrives on rye grain after a heavy rain followed by sunshine. So that's typically right during harvest time. And so it would usually kind of only be like one harvest cycle or two, but it would be uh, it would be concentrated into like one place since the farms like didn't feed the amount of people that our farms do now. Um, okay. It's not like every single mar farm was affected by ergot mold, just like in these small places. And they didn't know that's what it was at the time, so there was no way to control yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was actually one of my questions, sort of. I just yeah. so through your research on specifically on herbatism, just how far flung, how far spread it was. So. Um, uh, so. Bosch in, in central Netherlands. Um, yeah, so northwestern Germany in Eisenheim and, 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 and Alsace region, uh, present day France. That's what so, the work, um. so, yeah, in um, primarily in uh, the northern part of the Brabant province in the Netherlands, which is kind of just like the easternmost part. Uh, I think that was where it was most concentrated in the Netherlands, but I know in the south of France had it really bad. It was one of the first outbreaks that started in uh, 1093, and that's when the original hospital that shed light on this disease was created. And so, um, I mean, those are the major two spots. I mean, it has a lot to do with climate. And so ergot wouldn't be able to thrive in most climates. It's very, it's very particular. I mean, I know it's happened it's happened other places, but not nearly this uh, impactful. So it was nothing, nothing close to the uh, to the Black Death, the plague, no. No. Where, which was spread essentially throughout the entire Europe, with, with very few exceptions. Uh huh. Uh, so it was much more localized to specific locations. Because mm -hmm. so, uh, it wasn't a virus or anything; it was caused by eating the mold. So it wasn't. It, it it's not like it spread. Any more questions, some comments and suggestions, anything, please. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Okay, um, I have two questions. Um, the, the first is um, the central panel seems to have sort of a progression um, from left to right. Um, and I'm seeing sort of a, a dark to light, maybe time of day kind of thing, mm -hmm. or is it could be seen as sort of more grotesque to maybe more hopeful um, in, in that central panel. Yeah, um, for sure. I think to that, I have another comment as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think a lot of it is purposeful. Um, in a lot of Bosch's work, you can kind of see this, uh, this like trailing in and out, but still very obviously three separate scenes. Um, but yeah, I definitely think it's uh, purposeful for him to kind of go from this area kind of like of uncertainty to this area of chaos to this area where he's finally kind of reached his uh, spot of contemplation. So I think it definitely has right. a lot to do with that. Yeah. Um, my second question is, is really about your experience um, in seeing these works in situ um, and learning about them in the places that they were made, um, both in uh, the Netherlands and Spain. And were you able to get close to any of them? And so what was it like to see them in person for you? What was that experience like? Um, truly remarkable. Um, it gave me so much more it made me so much more passionate about my work itself. It gave me, I mean, I went to the Prado and I stared at, I stared at Bosch's paintings for like an hour and a half and just took notes because every single time you look at this, you see something new. And in real life, it they're, they're pretty huge. So it's very like, 
it's it's awe inspiring and I was just I was just telling Geddes like there are things in this that I I've been studying this for over a year I've been staring at these paintings for over a year and there's still things that like I find and I'm like oh wow like that's something to include but it was phenomenal great Melissa please um, I had a question about, um, you talked a little bit about symbolism you're finding in the work um, based on ways that they treated this disease. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you discovered that after researching the paintings for a significant amount of time, um, and then if you saw those kinds of treatments reflected in other work that maybe wasn't as filled with iconography or symbolism. Um, because I, I, the mandrake root is a very specific looking mm -hmm. thing yeah um not very appealing so i'm wondering if you saw that anywhere that maybe um especially from the period or the area when you were there i'm um, seeing other work um i was in the reichs museum looking for this and i found a couple that were kind of there like i could make a connection but it wasn't as strong as this um so i think that is something that's kind of significant to bosch when it comes to including the symbolism overall in his work. So I didn't see it very much, very you much else. that it was used for, I think you said infertility mm -hmm. as well. Did you, did you do other research on these treatments to see what else they would have been used for at the time and how they would have concluded that that would be a good, a good solution? So, Just I mean, it's the Middle Ages. Like, they didn't know anything about how medical diagnosis should actually be run. So I don't know where they came up with it. I've definitely heard of it used, I mean, for thousands of years uh, as treatment for different things. I mean, they would primarily wear it as a talisman. Uh, that's how they would uh, primarily want to treat infertility. And I'm not quite sure how they applied it for, like, St. Anthony's Fire and Fever. I'm pretty sure it was just with a, a talisman. But, um... Yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just, I thought it was really interesting that such like a gnarled thing would be related to such a disease that would disfigure people. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it almost seemed like they went together just because of those. Oh, yeah. The visual attributes seemed to apply, especially mm -hmm. in this book. Yeah, Mandrake's known for being uh, eerily human-like in some ways, but just off enough to be very unsettling so i definitely think that's something that somebody uh under the influence of psychedelics would interpret for a demon or something i also have a question about treatment so as you mentioned the antonite monks i regard it well that, and that number one treatment is the pair number two treatment is mandrake and talismans made of mandrake but um if you could uh repeat or maybe um, detail a little bit um, one of the yet another aspect of the treatment that you mentioned in the presentation but um, maybe just repeating it would be useful in the in the representation of the festival of the holy vintage mm -hmm. there is this kind of well priestess the scene that gives a cup to mm -hmm. one of the attendees so mm -hmm. yeah um, at the very at the very center, yeah. So here is this like brass or, or, or golden cup, is given to uh, is given to the victims of um, uh, of, of herbatism. Mm -hmm. um, did you find any any evidence or any information of that elixir or that that potion that they, they were making um, for the Holy Vintage uh, Festival? What it was made of? It was made of. I mean, I in the in the Middle Ages, they kind of just had a generic mixing for most apothecary so needs. Kind of herbal yeah, so it'd just be herbs and wines and like expensive spices and stuff, and they would like bless it or pray over it and anoint it. But yeah, the thing that set it apart um, in this particular iconography is that it was purportedly strained over the bones of St. Anthony himself. And so uh, that would give it another boost in magical properties. And the promise was that you will either heal. Or you're either here or you'll die. <laughs> and then either way, your, 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 your torch is going to be over, right? Yeah, either way, you're going to be fine. 
So, uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a question about a little bit about the process of your research. Mm -hmm. So, when you began um, doing readings on Iranian Bosch last summer, this ergotism and San Anthony's fire was not was not really kind of on the horizon. Where and how did you come up with this idea um, of ergotism and the significance of, of San Anthony's fire or ergotism in the iconography of the Iranian's Bosch? So, it, I stumbled upon it, honestly. I mean... But tell us, yeah? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I was really passionate about writing about Bosch uh, from the get-go. I knew that's what I wanted to write about, but, um, I, I just wanted to find something that, like, it wasn't super well known about his work, and so I, I was looking into it, looking into it, trying to figure out, like, what influences in his childhood he would have, um, that would have had, like, you know, that he would have had, uh, going forward with these paintings, um, and I just, I just saw somewhere that he and his father would tend to victims of St. Anthony's fire uh, in a church. So I was like, what's St. Anthony's fire? And that's how I found this. And I thought it was very uh, interesting. So I followed this path. I think uh, just speaking that, well, you'll still have to complete your bachelor thesis. I think it would be a nice little detail to include into, 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 into the introduction about the circumstances that led you to this kind of very specialized, very focused, like laser focused research on uh, the effects of herbatism um, on, on the art of the Iran and Bosch. So okay. Just, yeah, right? for sure. Please, uh, um, comments, questions. Well, I, I, I have. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so my question was, you said that in 1951, um, there was an outbreak in France of St. Anthony's fire. Mm -hmm. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? And like, is this something that is like, are people still getting ergotism? Like, is this still happening? And if so, like, what are the treatments like and how is kind of medicine changed? Mm -hmm. I guess if you know. So it's kind of a really funny historical timeline. So... They, I mean, obviously during this time, they had no idea what was causing it, had no idea it was ergot mold. Um, but I think in the 18th century, they had been doing some, like, testing with it and experimentation with it. And they actually began uh, prescribing it to women who were very pregnant to speed childbirth and to ease la labor pains. And so, okay. I, yeah, and so... Um, Later in, uh, I think it was in the 40s, could be wrong, um, is when, oh, I forget his name, but it's when uh, ergot mold was more thoroughly experimented with, you know, with at least somewhat modern medical technology, and uh, lysergic acid was discovered in it, and that's where um, LSD was accidentally invented. So obviously that <laughs> was no longer prescribed to people. Um, and now... So in the 1951 outbreak, they knew what was happening. It was just after the fact they found out. They're like, oh, no, like we've been feeding people moldy bread that's poison. So I think that was mostly just a matter of like a rehabilitation thing and not like a you're going to die kind of thing. And it's only it's only okay. really poisonous if you ingest it over a long period of time and then it slowly uh, decays with you. So I guess that would be like when you know, people were eating this forever ago. They were probably also like, you know, fermenting that rye to make things yeah. with. They were probably also using that rye and flour and kind of like mm -hmm. using using it in so different ways. Yeah, so, for sure. And so to uh, to answer your question, uh, yes, they, it, it does happen today, but it's significantly rare because, I mean, our food handling uh, uh, standards are a lot higher now and perhaps um, that we know already that the easiest way of treating it is just stop eating that yeah that, bread. and that's so why a lot of the times avoid rye bread and yeah. in the early stages that's the most effective treatment. well and that yeah and that's what they would do i mean they would go to these hospitals and it's not like the monks would know what they're doing to to heal them so they would think it was prayer but I mean, they were just feeding them wheat instead because that's what the hospitals could afford instead of rye for the poorer people. 
More questions, more comments, please. I, I had a question. I visited the um, uh, Salem, um, where they had the witch trials up in New England and Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And they um, possibly thought that it was an infection of um, the grain, and they didn't say too much about it, which sounds very similar to what this is, that they would have uh, some of the, the girls that were accused of being witches uh, had hallucinations, and they thought maybe that this would be it. Do you know of any other times and places in history, I know you mentioned some, uh, that where this disease was actually diagnosed and mm -hmm. where it's you know, been repeated? Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure it only became began uh, legitimately diagnosable, I mean, in the second half of the 20th century, for sure. Um, but throughout time, yeah, like I, like I mentioned, I think there were the witch trials in Europe was, this was a big cause of like women that were like hallucinating and doing crazy things. And everyone thought they were a witch cause they like blaming things on people. And so unfortunately I think that's a lot of it in Salem. However, I'm not, I, I don't want to say for sure that that's what happened in Salem. Cause I, I didn't read that, mm -hmm. um, or got affected them, but it's very possible. It's very possible. It's very probable. Does that answer your question? Jane, I have a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. um, first, a comment. Um, if, if you're interested in finding more information about the mandrake root and also maybe the ingredients in the um, holy vintage, uh, you might want to look at medieval herbals. A lot oh. of times those will diagram um, mandrake roots um, and other different types of herbs and plants and um, indicate what they would have been used to treat and how they would have been prepared. That might be a source you can look at for figuring out more about the mandrake root and also the holy vintage. Oh yeah, um, thank you, Katie. Yeah, my, uh, my question for you is, do you find these images of people suffering from ergot only in Bosch's uh, representations of St. Anthony's fire, or do you find them also, for instance, in like hell scenes? done by Bosch. Mm. Wait, so you're asking me if this is a uh, scene in Bosch's other works or just in, or in other artists' works? Um, in Bosch's other works, um, other than the ones that depict St. Anthony's temptations. Um, yeah, so the only ones I could find that weren't 100% related to temptations was um, just the, stu the studies. Mm -hmm of hang on, i'm trying to find it uh just the studies here um i think that it was pretty uh specific to say uh the temptations of saint anthony do to pick this and there i did find some evidence and other stuff but it was it was some of bosch's work that is attributed to him but it's like you know, it's probably like a workshop or a follower or something. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to include anything that I wasn't very sure of, you know? Yeah. I'm just wondering if maybe there's a connection between, um, you know, representing this as a form of affliction that may happen to you if you end up in hell, mm. um, as other representations, you know, of, of illnesses and disease showing mm -hmm. people in hell suffering from these types of afflictions. Mm -hmm. That's just what, that was just what I was curious about if it mm -hmm. turns up in um, images not related to St. Anthony's temptations, but maybe just hell scenes in general in Bosch's work. Mm -hmm. There's a few images. Um, it's not anything that I think is purposefully contributing to the iconography of this disease. But there are a few images in his, like the Hay Wayne, uh, I know for sure has a couple representations of illness. Um, but again, it wasn't completely explicit, so I didn't want to, you know, mm. go and go too far into detail on that. Um, yeah, and I think overall, like boils and you know disease appearance is in a couple of his hell scenes. But again, nothing that's super significant to ergotism. Mm -hmm. You have to bear in mind that in the Middle Ages and in the early Renaissance, which is sort of Bosch lived on this kind of transition, that uh, actual physical Ill illnesses, the way we understand them now, they were in, in, in the mindset, in the worldview of those people, they were not much different from 
let's say, sins or spiritual afflictions, such as greed or lust, for example. And so one being affected by greed or lust can suffer equally in hell as one being afflicted by something like ergotism that causes these terrible, terrible hallucinations and, and, uh, and physical pain. Mm-hmm. And so in, in a number of Bosch's work, well, probably the best known is the garden of the earthly delights. So it's people who suffer in hell on the right hand side panel again, mm-hmm. uh, are the people who suffer essentially from these various, well, what is described as sins in the Bible, essentially. And so the disease, the physical disease and spiritual disease uh, were not, there was not a hard separation between those two. They were just a kind of disease of the, disease of the soul. Nobody, mm-hmm. because nobody had an idea of virus or, or bacteria or fungus and what it yeah. meant. These notions are very modern. And I think that the difference between the two of the time, I mean, would be the way that others would perceive it. So, I mean, if you have physical illness, if they can physically see you have marks on your body, you have an injury, then, I mean, that is, like, easier for them to see, easier for them to associate with the wrath of God. But mental illness, um, I mean, obviously was seen as that, but when it came to just, like, any sort of mental illness, any sort of psychotic break, any sort of, um, you know, like, a psychedelic ingestion through ergotism uh it was mostly blamed on people for being witches or for being crazy and they'd get locked up and you know more questions comments suggestions please um i just want to say that i i'm really impressed with this presentation and i'm um i'm really glad that i was able to see it this is something that i had no idea was part of his um, body of work, and I've been a fan for a long time, so this was really interesting. Thank um, and the you. questions have been really good, and I'm super proud of you. This is really, really great. Thank you, Melissa. That means a lot. All right, one more last question, I'll come, please. Jane, I have a question. Mm-hmm. The mandrake root you said they used for infertility. Mm-hmm. And the young lady that's in the river that is to be drawing in the men, per mm-hmm. se, appears to be portly. Um, to me, she looks pregnant. Do you think mm-hmm. that that symbolism has anything to do with um the root, the drawing in of the men, and how it ties into the creature in the water that could, in my interpretation, could be coming to take the child. It's possible. Um, I'm leaning towards not reading quite that much into it, just because this is how Bosch uh, depicted most of his female figures um okay. it's pretty much yeah it's pretty similar to the rest of his work it's definitely possible it's definitely plausible but from from my knowledge about his work i don't think that's what that means but it's possible okay so if you look at the at that, uh, uh, representations of um, nude female bodies in modern renaissance such as bald and green or Hans Memling, you will see that this is uh, this is kind of the type of, of females that, that that painters represent. Because at that time, um, in in the early 16th century, probably only most of the Italians were looking at the actual models, um, and the, the artists from other countries they were looking at the other pictures for mm-hmm. them, them to serve as prototypes, as models for various objects and, and for various human poses and so on. So. I do not know for the fact, but one possibility is that um, Euronius Bosch simply looked at, at his contemporaries, uh, at the pictures of his contemporaries for the uh, for the types of female bodies to include in his own work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. This was enlightening. This was very interesting. And I think Jane res- deserves a, a round of applause. So unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, guys. I'm so glad all of you were able to make it. It means so much to have all of your support. I'm so proud of you. Thank you very much for, uh, everybody for participating and attending making it possible at the somewhat unusual time for all of yes. us. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you again. And Jane, we'll talk more. Yes, I'll be in touch and, uh, soon. And for now, I'm saying goodbye to everybody and ending this meeting. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, Geddes. Thanks, Thanks you, everyone. Love you, Dad. <laughs>